That's Genesis chapter 6. You start from the left, if you don't know where it's at in your Bible. And you start there at the beginning, and Genesis means beginning. The book of Origins explains just about everything that you need to know in order to understand where you came from, who God is, and how you can know Him. In the scripture printing that we're printing in June, as well as the scripture that uh, we printed a couple of years ago, we included Genesis chapters 1 through 3. And one of the reasons is because it explains, gives answers to things that a lot of people don't know. Where did I come from? Where did sin come from? And uh, we live in a culture and in a time where people have never heard of who Jesus is. They've never heard of God. And they haven't even heard the scriptural account of creation in our country. And I'm speaking of individuals that have reached adult age. There are many people who are angry and mad at God and they don't even know the account of creation. They don't even know where sin came from. And so it's important as believers that we have a good firm grasp on origins as well as a solid faith in the authority of the Scripture, the authenticity of the Word of God and its practicality in our lives. I don't need evidence that proves that the Genesis account is true. I believe that the Genesis account is true, and that's enough for me. The Word of God has done its work in my life enough that it's more convincing to me than anything else. Yes, uh, yes, if you study and you search, you'll find that everything in creation is explained in Genesis and that it's true. But it's not true because we've proved it. It's true because God said so. And that's the approach that we're taking in this study in Genesis. Our approach is God's word is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. And so I'll just believe it. Incidentally, you won't convince somebody of something just because you can prove it to them. Now, if someone is searching for facts and they're out fact-gathering and they're looking to discover truth, well, then you can present facts to them that will point them to truth. Somebody says, well, how do I know the Bible is the Word of God? Well, the first thing that you should tell them is read it. Read it. It'll convince you that it's the Word of God. No book can speak to you and speak truth with the power of God's Spirit like this book. The Word of God. Well, last week we saw the uh, position of sin. We saw the two lines, the line of Cain and the line of Seth, where the two have merged together. And the earth has become so wicked that it is a time when God is getting ready to destroy the earth. And so we'll pick up down in verse 5. We'll see some of the scripture that we looked at last week, and then we'll continue down through verse 13. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold... I will destroy them with the earth. Now look down to verse 22 of that same chapter. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Well, let's pray. Father, help us tonight as we have simple instruction that shows us your character, which has been unchanging throughout time. And Father, as we glean the promises that are, that are inherent in even the condemnations of the Scripture, I pray that you would help us to both see your holiness and, Father, help us to see hope in the times in which, even when it was wicked, there were those who pleased you. We praise you for what you'll do. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Well, last night, of course, we, or last Sunday evening, seems like last night, the way the weeks passed by. Uh, the last Sunday evening, though, we had the opportunity to really kind of delve into Genesis chapter 6 and 
look at the connection in the two genealogical lines. There was the line of Cain, which is mentioned, and then we see that in the days of Seth that men began to call upon God, call upon the Lord. And so there was a godly line, there was an ungodly line. And then in chapter 6 we see this merging of the righteous with the wicked. Christian, it is vitally important that we understand our place in this world. Our place is to be salt and to be light. We are not to penetrate or to immerse ourselves in the world's culture so that we can uh, so that you know we can convert the world in that way, but we are to be in the world and be a contrast. Our position as believers is always in a position of contrast or peculiarity. We'll always be different if we're godly. Now, there is a difference. I say this sometimes because it, I guess it, it hits my funny bone a little bit just thinking about it. Uh, different does not mean weird. Now, there are weird people, and there are people that are peculiar people, uh, and, and weird and peculiar are not the same. Idiosyncratic behavior uh, is not godly in itself. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, I, I just think of many times the impression that I had as a kid. If there was a separated godly family, what I thought in my mind was they, you know, mom and dad had uh, 13 kids and they had a 15 passenger van. Um, mom and the, and the ladies all wore jean jump skirts and the uh, women wore their hair on top of their head as tight as they possibly could. And uh, they were, and they all talked in nasal tones and, uh, and were weird. Okay. And I thought, well, that's what, that's what uh, separated Christians are. And uh, But I, I found out later that you don't have to be saved to be weird. I've met people that are lost as they can be, and they're just as weird as they can be. And I found out that the reason that there are weird people in churches is because God saves weird people. That is not the same as peculiar. And by the way, I, I, I enjoy weird, and I tend to. And I look around, and I, oh, man. Okay. And I, I think, I'm thinking nothing right now. My mind's trying to be empty. All right. <laughs> all right. The reason there are strange people in the church is because God saves all kinds. And so he, he saves the kind that would be uh, considered to be more normal. And he saves uh, the kind that are more intelligent. He saves the kind that are less intelligent. God saves all kinds of people. That is not what the Bible is talking about when it requires us as believers to be a peculiar people. But understand and know that when you're saved and you're a Christian, you will stand out. I can't think where it was, but I think it was yesterday, maybe Friday it was. Uh, my wife and I were up in Melbourne, and we saw ladies that were dressed modestly. Not weird, but just modestly. And I said, you know what, they look like Christians. I don't know whether they were or not. Didn't We were driving by, but they just they had a look. They stood out. They actually uh, just had a modesty about them that made them look like they probably were Christians. And that's what the scripture is talking about. There is a, uh, there is a godliness that is exuded from people. I remember being in Delray Beach one time. I was at, I was in my work jeans, and I was working on some things over at the church, and I, I stopped into Winn Dixie for something, and I was in line, and a man behind me said, "Excuse me, are you a Christian?" And I said, "Yes, I am." He said, "I just could sense that you were a Christian. I don't know. Maybe I put off some kind of a weird aura or something." I, <laughs> no, um, I think it was something about my demeanor. I was standing in line at Publix in Del Rey at lunch at noon, or and Win Dixie. I mean, at noon. Go stand in Win Dixie at noon sometime <laughs> in Del Rey Beach, and I guess you'll understand why my behavior was perhaps different than the other people there. Now, if you don't know, it's a in in the winter time. It's almost that area is almost 100% retired people. And when the working people go to lunch is when all the retired people decide that they're going to go to lunch as well. And they go shopping. And so here you got people that are in a hurry, and then you have people that aren't in a hurry all merged together. And it makes for an unhappy situation on almost a daily basis. It's fun to watch, but uh, not fun to participate in. Okay. All right. So now, one of the things that we find from Genesis in chapter 6, though, is that God's people, the people that are godly, the Bible says the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and the scripture says they took wives of all which they chose. We find that the end result of this merging of two lines, of a godly line and an ungodly line, is that they become very, very wicked. They became mighty men of renown. The Bible says in verse old, men of known 
or men which mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so here we go from this time, from this era, in the days of Seth, when men began to call upon the Lord. And now we go to a time in which men are just all wicked. And that's what will happen, Christian. That's what will happen if you think it's okay to involve yourself in public education. Hey, your kids aren't going to be salt and light. Listen, children don't go to schools and change their teachers. Teachers teach children and change them. That's what will happen if you send your kids to public school. They'll wreck your children. That's what will happen if you send your kids to public college. They'll wreck your kids' children. That's what will happen when you place yourself under the teaching and under the philosophy and under the instruction of the wicked is that they will influence you. You'll not influence them, and you'll find that it is wicked continually. Uh, the, the, church, the, church is, the church's job, the church's goal, is not to go out and be like the world and reach the world. The church's goal and job is to go out and be different from the world and reach the world. And that, that does work. There are people, last week, there are two different individuals that I've been corresponding with last week that are looking for something different. Something different than the thing that has destroyed them, that's dissatisfied them, that has caused their lives to be a wreck. They're looking for something that's different. And that is the attraction. Hey, there is an attraction in this book. This needs to be what a church is all about, is this book, this Bible. This is a wonderful book. Did you read it this last week? Did you read it today? Did you get in the Bible and study it? Did you see what an amazing amount of truth and how it's just limitless. It is unmatched in its wisdom. It's unmatched in its beauty. And every time you go to this book, it'll thrill your heart and God's Spirit will speak to your soul and He'll encourage you and challenge you and help you to grow. That's the nature of the Word of God and that's that's the attraction of a believer. We are uh, to be in this book and we're to be people of the book. And when we open this, there are people that are hungry and looking for it, searching for it. Hey, it's a good idea if you're a parent and you've got a family and you have a family table or maybe you sit down to dinner once a day or once every week or sometime and open the Word of God and just read a couple of verses and talk about it. It's a good idea to invite somebody to come and participate and eat at your table and just to, just to feast on the Word of God with you. It's amazing how hungry many children are that, that wish that they could go sit at a place where mom or dad would teach and preach the Word of God and they could just sit there and feast along with your children. You'd be amazed at how just opening up the doors of your home and just not doing anything spectacular, not cramming anything down anybody's throat, but just opening the Word of God and feeding them right along with everybody else. It's amazing how uh, people desire to be in your house and how they desire to come around you. And we as Christians, we ought to have that mindset. It ought to be salt and light in that manner. Now, God has said, though, because of what's happened here, because I've done the opposite, the righteous are not separating. They're not... And they're not being light, they're not being salt, they've merged themselves. The Lord said in verse 7, I will destroy man. Or, I'm sorry, I want to look at verse 6. It repented the Lord that he had made a man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. I want you to notice a common theme that we have seen as we have looked at God and his character. Have you seen not only God's mercy, but have you seen just the tenderness of holy God and how that it grieves God when man sins? Hey, I don't want you to misunderstand. I don't want you to think God is helplessly wringing His hands in heaven when somebody thwarts His will. It's not the idea that we're sharing here at all this evening. But friend, heaven is moved. Heaven is moved when both God's people are wicked and heaven is moved when the righteous blood of Jesus Christ is rejected. God does have an opinion and He does care. You know, the Calvinist today uh, paints this picture of this angry God who doesn't care. And friend, it's not so. It isn't so. God wants people to be saved. It's a desire of His heart and it grieves God. It grieves God when man chooses wickedness instead of righteousness. And don't you forget it. You'll find it over and over again in the Scripture. And it ought to make an impression on us, God's character and His nature. Hey, parents, how many of you being good parents, and always are we not as, are we not always instructed that parents are a model of our Heavenly Father and of what God is, what you are to your children, God is to you? Hey, how many parents are, are unmoved when your children stray, when they move from the truth, when they're in a place of danger, a place of potential judgment? How many of you, it just doesn't matter, just doesn't care? You're just ready to execute judgment? I'll just kick them out of the home. I'll just be done with them. I'll just write them off. They've rejected my truth. No, no, no. A loving parent's grieved, are they not? Are they not, are they not moved to grief? Are they not concerned over the welfare or the safety? Uh, do they not 
Do they not spend hours in prayer? Do you not, uh, do you not be, are you not burdened? When I think of people in our church who are not living for God, you know, even today there are people that I know aren't here, and the reason they're not here is because they're not doing well as they ought to. And, uh, you know, I, I'm concerned about them. I'm hurt for them. And, you know, I don't think, well, you know what, they should have been in church. We just, you know what, they're obviously not going to make it, and so we might as well just write them off and move on, find some good Christians to replace them. No, not at all. And I want you to understand, Christian, that God in heaven cares. It does matter. It does matter whether the lost accept or reject Jesus as their Savior. And it does matter whether or not Christians respond to God's love and whether or not they grow in grace and whether or not uh, they move forward in their spiritual walk with Him. God cares, and God cares about you. You need to understand that God's love for you is not impersonal. It is very, very personal. God knows your name as He loves you. He knows your circumstances as He loves you. And He is compassionate in His heart towards you. And we find that because man as a whole have rejected God and His righteousness and rejected the system in which He has given them to be reconciled to Him through sacrifices of faith, we find that as a, as a consequence of that, the heart of God, the Bible says in heaven, is grieved. And that is a strong statement. It's not something we ought to just waltz over and act as though, well, I'm not sure exactly what that means. It means what it says, God is grieved. Do you think that the wickedness in our culture does not grieve God? Hey, it doesn't surprise me and it doesn't surprise God. The wicked ought to be wicked. That's what they are. But it grieves God. It's not as though it doesn't matter. It'll be personal. It will be personal. When individuals come before God at the day when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, it will be very personal. God in heaven will have grieved over the individuals that are banished to hell for eternity because of their rebellion and their choice of unbelief. It matters to God. Understand this and know this. Hey, Christian, Tuesday night when you go out soul winning and you knock on doors... And you let people, you, you strive and you attempt, you try as hard as you can do to have an opportunity. Just get a gospel tract in there. Just get the chance to share Jesus Christ and God's love. Understand, God loves that person that you're talking to. Understand, God's desire and His heart for that person is that they would turn from their wickedness and be saved. Uh, several weeks ago, my wife and I talked to a man who was probably as blasphemous as anyone I've ever met. He was as probably as great a blasphemy as, as anyone I've ever met. And he'd been exposed to all kinds of religion. He'd never been saved. He didn't know God. He thought he knew Baptist. He thought he'd, uh, he'd tried just about every religion you could think of. He knew more religions than I'd ever heard of, probably. And had tried and experimented with him. And he was so angry. I never got a chance to share the gospel with him. He, I, I listened to him for probably half an hour as he uh, just got angrier and angrier and angrier. Never, never commented. Never got a chance to reply. Never got to share anything with him. And he ended up just blaspheming God as we, as we left. And I just thought, my goodness, that man is not only in rebellion, he is, he is unbelievably blasphemous against God. I'm amazed when a teenager not only disrespects his parents, but actually will curse his parents and, and scream at his parents and fight his parents and kick and, and hate and just express just a, just a vehement hatred toward his parents. It amazes me. It ought to be so ever. And many times growing up, I'm familiar with some situations where parents were pretty mild toward their children, where, you know, mom and dad loved them, didn't correct them like they should have, but loved the kids and, and uh, really never never harmed their children, never did anything to be unkind or mean toward them, and yet the parents just, they, you know, the children grew up just as mean as they could be and as awful as they could, and here's mom and dad in tears, and, and son is just screaming and yelling and berating them and telling them he hates them, he wishes that he'd never been born. He curses them for the day he's born. You just think, my goodness, how in the world could somebody ever come to that place? And yet the mom and dad still love him for whatever reason. You stand by and you think, my goodness, I don't love him. I would, I would, I don't, you know, that person needs to be dealt with. They need to be taught a lesson. Well, God in heaven loves the wicked. And don't forget it. Don't forget it, Christian. God loves the wicked. And he's extremely merciful. But see, we don't have any idea about mercy except we, when we study God's mercy. We think many times that we're merciful, but we don't have any idea to the great extent that God's mercy extends. And God's mercy has extended so far at this point that the Bible says with the exception of one man in the world, 
that the thoughts and the intent of man was just to do wicked and evil continually. The idea is just as much wickedness as they can, just as much blasphemy. And they knew it was against God. They weren't just satisfying and gratifying themselves. They were in rebellion against holy God in heaven. They knew what they were doing. And they're just as wicked as they can be. And so God's, the Bible says, it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him at His heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So God said, you know what, there's nothing here. The only thing left here is the earth. I could remake it. But as far as man and the beast and the creeping things go, there's nothing that has any kind of worth or value but Noah. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And now we find that God gives another genealogy, another line of godliness, another line in which He worked through man. Now, do, have we seen so far a little bit of a theme? Do you remember this? And every time that man has sinned, we find a theme that there is in every generation a genealogical line or there is a time which is traced in which men are faithful to God. In every time period. By the way, this is part of Baptist history. You say, Pastor, oh boy, here we go again. Yeah, here we go. We're coming up. We're going to talk about it. Do you know that there's a period when the church that was called the church was so merged with the political church in the Roman Empire that, that it wasn't a church at all? And you know, at the same time, there were believers that had nothing to do with that church. They were just independent. They just believed the Bible. They say, you say, Pastor, no, that only, the, only the Catholic Church had the Bible. That's baloney. Only the Catholic Church corrupted the Bible. And that's the facts. You study it. The corrupt texts come from Catholicism. The good texts come from a church that never was part of Catholicism. And so you study it. You figure that out. You find out for yourself. And one of the themes that we're finding in Genesis is something that has been true from Adam all the way until today. And the theme that we're finding is that God always has a faithful remnant. The Joseph Smith uh, didn't all of a sudden uh, discover, oh, you know what, the church has been bad for a couple thousand years. Nobody's known God, but, uh, you know, this angel, what was his name, Moroni? Yeah, angel named Moron uh, came and gave him some special revelation. And now, you know, we now we have the truth again uh, from from history that never happened. I, if, if, you're in, if you're in for a good time sometime, get together with a bunch of people and read the Book of Mormon and just have some fun about it. Maybe we'll do it tonight at my place. I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's a comical book. It, it, is, it is so ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's not even a fairy tale. I mean, fairy tales, you know, you can see how it could... You can imagine how a fairy tale could happen, but you read the Book of Mormon, you can't even imagine. <laughs> it's just too far-fetched to reinvent history and so forth. It's sad how far man in his rebellion goes uh, to, to vaunt himself against God. Now, here's the exception. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Do you see this? Noah was a just man, the Bible says, and perfect in his generations. So we know what the word perfect really is understood to mean in our language. It's not understood to mean sinless. The, the idea of perfect is understood to be fit or everything that it ought to be. Just perfectly acceptable, just perfectly fine, perfectly good. And that's Noah and his generations. And the Bible says, and Noah walked with God. Well, what does it mean, Noah and his generations? Well, you remember, Noah was just two generations back from Adam. And so here he is tracing in this line. And, and as the sons of God and the daughters of men had come, have come and they've merged the lines, we find Noah's here at the same time that this is happening, the same time, quote unquote, that spooks are being born, you know, angelic beings are merging with mankind. I'm being sarcastic about that. Didn't happen at all. It's nonsensical. And uh, it, it leads to bad, not just bad theology, it leads to mysticism and mythology and, and uh, really to heathen worship, that kind of theology does. And so Noah was there and he saw this. He saw wicked people merging themselves with the people that came from the godly lines. And the end result was what? Well, Noah was unchanged. That's what the end result was. And he just walked perfectly in his generations. And Noah walked with God, the Bible says. Did you notice that statement? That's quite a statement, isn't it, in verse 9? Isn't it quite a statement in a time in which God saw that, that a man was that the thoughts of his heart, every imagination, the thought of his heart was only evil continually? 
and that was the blanket statement in general for everybody except for one man. Who walked with God up to this point? Adam. Adam had walked with God in the garden in the cool of the evening. That's quite a statement, isn't it? See, what Noah was in perfect fellowship with God. Perfect fellowship with God. Can I remind you of the day and age in which Noah lived? Do you remember where he lived, when he lived? He lived in the days of the most vile and the most wicked. Things were as bad in the days of Noah as they ever were. Hey, Christian, this, this uh, spiritualization of the concept of pitching your tent towards Sodom. I've heard people talk about, you know, we need to move out of the wicked cities and we need to uh, separate ourselves from the worlds and basically get ourselves in a little Christian compound community. What terrible things happen in those communities, by the way. Hey, the more terrible things happen in small towns. I tell you, the most dangerous places in the United States you can live oftentimes are small Baptist towns. And it's not because the Baptists are wicked, but people are wicked everywhere. And being in a small town doesn't protect anyone from anything. I remember growing up in Kansas, in little, little small towns, some of the most atrocious murders and just awful things happening. You just never would have thought. You thought, well, you know, everybody here knows everybody. Uh, we all feel safe. We leave our keys in our cars. We leave our doors unlocked. And then somebody comes in and does something just terrible. Well, that's the truth. The idea that somehow as a Christian you can separate yourself from wickedness, the only way you could do that would be if you just eliminated all your siblings and all your family and all your friends and everybody around you, and you'd have to be a pretty good person after you committed murder <laughs> to get rid of them. See, it couldn't be done, could it, if you really think about it. See, as long as you're around sinners, there will be sin. And we as believers don't pitch our tent towards Sodom. We as believers are salt and light. And here's Noah, and he is in grand contrast. I promise you, in a day and age in which everyone in the world is living just as wickedly as they can, so much so that it repents God that he's made man on the earth, and Noah walked with God perfectly, I promise you, Noah was a stark contrast. Pastor must have been dangerous for Noah in those days. No, it really wasn't at all. You know why? Because he walked with God. And it isn't dangerous for you to live for God either, my friend, because if God has called you to be set apart and separate, there's nothing, no evil, there's nothing that can happen to you that is not for God's best, not for God, that God is not going to use. And if God's going to use you, can I say to you that anything God wants to do in your life, as Brother Chris taught this morning, is a blessing. Anything God wants to grant in your life is a wonderful thing if it's for the service of the king. And so nothing terrible can befall someone whom God loves. You walk perfectly with the Lord, and you can do it if you're the only one in the world. And that's the situation that Noah had. It doesn't matter how many individuals are on that broad path that leads to destruction. You be on the narrow way. You be on the narrow road. Young people, hey, there's no one in the world that can force you into sin. They can't destroy your life. They can't push you into wickedness. You can just live for God. And you can walk with God perfectly. That's God's plan for you. That's what He intends for you. And it's completely, entirely possible. And God will do great things with you, just as He did with Noah. Well, Noah had some sons. The Bible says, and Noah begat uh, three sons. Notice this is after it talked about Noah and his generations. You ever wonder about that? <laughs> you think about the sin of, the sin of Ham and uh, the, the, just the, some of the problems that his sons had after the flood. And uh, you think, man, Noah walked perfectly with God in all gener his generations. No, I was speaking of Noah in particular in the generations in which he lived. And he lived through a lot of generations because it was 600 years. He was 600 years old, according to verse 6 of chapter 7, when the flood of waters was upon the earth. So Noah walked through several generations, you might imagine. Quite a few more than we can. If a generation can occur, uh, it being, being generous once every 50 years, uh, in, at 600 years, Noah had been through 12 generations. If a generation could, could occur every 30 years, why, then Noah had been through 18 generations. If a generation could occur every 20 years, then Noah had lived uh, through 120 generations. So he'd seen some generations, if you, if you know what we're saying here this evening. And so Noah walked with God. Now, God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, if you don't mind, go right to the middle of your Bible to, uh, to Psalm chapter 37. And this is a passage of Scripture. It's well known. It's one that you ought to know well. You ought to commit to memory if possible. If you're looking for a passage of Scripture to memorize, Psalm 37 is a good one all the way through it. It has some wonderful truths. 
And we want to see that, that David understood the same truth that Noah understood at this time. Psalm 37, verse 1, the Bible says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Well, friend, get the, the, the end of the wicked, the days of the wicked are short. Do you see this? And so the question is, Pastor, you know, how long can I endure? How long can I make it? Well, you can make it all your life. You can walk with the Lord all your life and understand and know that righteousness endureth forever. Righteousness lives forever. It doesn't end. Your rewards in heaven never go away. Your relationship with God will never cease. And so you can be righteous and understand that the end of wickedness uh, is, is short. Um, I have seen in my short lifetime, I have seen the wicked rise up and I have seen the wicked fall down. And I've seen them rise up again and fall down again. But their end's all the same. It doesn't matter how long their reign of wickedness is. They can have their little reign of terror. In conclusion, I was thinking today, uh, I was just thinking back of uh, some people. I, I know quite a few people that are in their late 90s, almost 100 years old. And I was just thinking of what they've seen in their lifetime. And I was just thinking of in, in uh, many people's short lifetime, you know, not too far back, you know, it seems, doesn't it seem to us today that World War II was a long time ago? It just seems like it was a long time ago. I, I don't remember it. It was a little bit before me, but it wasn't so long ago. My, my grandparents, of course, would have been, you know, mid, you know, adults in World War II, and they're not so very old. They get younger and younger as I get older and older, it seems. And so, uh, it really wasn't that long ago. Do you know how atrocious some of the acts and the, the wicked things that happened in World War II? You say, Pastor, oh, there's been genocide in recent generations. I know. But literally in the, in the 1940s, literally there was genocide across the European continent and in, 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 in Asia and all kinds of places where people were just massacred in the most cruel and atrocious and horrible ways. Of course, the Holocaust and those awful events uh, all occurred. And it's amazing that it wasn't even that long ago. You just think something that happened that terrible ago. It's amazing that my grandparents lived at that time and that there are people uh, in, in the area that, that I know and that I've spoken to recently that went through the Holocaust, that went through that. That wasn't so far ago. The most terrible thing I can imagine, the Holocaust is, to me, the, the most awful of atrocities that you could possibly imagine. And it really wasn't even that long ago. And yet, the, my grandparents' generation actually saw that come and go. They saw it come and they saw it go. <laughs> they saw some revival in our country back in the 1950s, 1960s, and even the 1970s. Saw great crusades. Saw people turn to God. And now they've seen it go. And do you know if the Lord tarries, we'll probably see God do a work again as well. We'll probably see great revival great movement toward God. And I want to make that a little bit more personal. Friend, we could be Noah's in our generation. We can be the godly. We can be the righteous that please God and walk perfectly before God. And if we do so, we'll have an influence. It'll matter how we live. Hey, there's hope, isn't there? There's hope. Hey, God is, God is, is on His throne. He's not threatened. Hey, God is still compassionate. He's still merciful. Matter of fact, after He destroyed the earth, we'll see in a couple of weeks, after this great flood, this great destruction, God promised He'd never again destroy the earth. He even granted that He would be more merciful than He'd ever been up to that point in time. God's a merciful God. Do you, have you grasped that? Have you, have you gotten just a little bit of a glimpse of how forbearing God is and how it grieves His heart? for there to be wickedness in the earth. If that's the heart of God toward man, what would happen if man responded? Well, that becomes very personal, doesn't it? What happened when you responded to God's mercy? Well, He very graciously saved you. Just as we find in the Scripture, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You and I found grace in the eyes of the Lord when we responded to His mercy. And friend, that's the hope. That's the promise. The Gospel has power to save God's mercy is not limited. His grace is not limited. He is willing to save anyone who calls upon Him. And so I want to remind you about that this evening as we begin to work and look at some really marvelous events of the flood that 
I believe will just help and strengthen us in our faith and encourage us. And we should learn some things in the next few weeks. I want us to begin by looking at God and His mercy in judgment. Father, help us to see that even in judgment, Lord, You are merciful. And Lord, I pray that You would help us to know Your mercy more than we know Your judgment. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.